Talking Art, and I'm Jane Treger, and we are at the Deerfield Arts Bank, and we are interviewing artists. I invite you to send me names of people you think I should interview, and also, and this is really important, any questions that I'm not asking that you really want me to ask artists. I may not think of something, and this is the opportunity. And for any messages you have to send to me of that type, send them to talkingart at fcat.tv. Today, we have with us Julie Cavaco. Hello. <laughs> and many of you locally know her as the children's librarian at um, Tilton Library in Deerfield. Yes. Welcome. Nice to be here. Thank you for having me. So are you a local, or what brought you here? I came to the area to go to UMass um, after high school, and then I graduated. And my parents actually moved out of the state. And I didn't want to move where they moved, so I decided to stay in the area. Oh, so you are from Massachusetts? Yeah, we're from just north of Boston, Winchester. So you're one of these students who came to UMass and just stayed? Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a wonderful place to live. It is, it is. And it was, it was convenient because at that point <coughs> it was homey enough and my parents moved to Maryland. And uh, I didn't, couldn't move back home, so right. I stayed here. Uh -huh. Home disappeared. Yes. <clears throat> so, um, tell us about art. How did you start doing art? Well, I'd have to say art's probably been a part of my life for always. I started when I was um, young, working on those um, uh, Girl Scouts activities and brownies and um, the little pot holders that you would make, and then I'd sell them in my yard, and I learned to knit early on, and I fell in love with textiles. Wait a minute, who taught you to knit? My mother. Yep, one summer vacation when I was in second grade. So I've always loved working with yarn and different, tech, you know, different techniques working with yarn. And um, just as I was kept on going, you know, I would always have it nearby because my mother knitted. So I just played around with stuff and just have kept it in my life ever for fifty years. Fifty years, yeah. <laughs> yep. That's good. Yeah. It's good. Did you study art? Um, no, I went to UMass for. Um, just wasn't sure why I was going there. I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a fourth grade art teacher because I loved my fourth grade teacher and I loved That's art. That's a good reason. Yep, but um, I didn't really have that in my mind when I went to school and I ended up landing in theater um, because my mother wanted me to have a degree because I was the youngest of four and she wanted all of her kids to have a degree. So she wasn't very particular about why I needed to go to college. She just wanted me, you know, to go to college. And so I said, well, I'll get a degree in theater. Never really planning on working in theater, oh. um, but just because it was just a, a, a real artistic major that, that was um, worked with people. It's like volunteering for things is working in theater. It's sort of there's a link, a commonality between working on projects and getting them done and then finishing it. So it's just it was a really great major for, for life in general. You know, I agree with you completely. I did a theater That's right. undergraduate degree, and I did not continue in theater. And it was theater design. And what it taught me was how to produce something. Yep. How to see a project from beginning to end of all sorts of different skill sets. And I think it actually gave me the, the guts to, to um, do volunteer work um, when my kids were growing up in the community. And, you know, like taking on projects and following it through and and um, working with people is great and, um, and it sort of has been really probably the best part of my job um, is that those skills that I got in theater really have been helping the best in terms of the children's room and working in, with kids and designing bulletin boards and doing events. It's because I had that sort of background where yes. you put things on. So. I see it completely. Yeah, it's perfect, isn't it? It is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I think we should send all our children to That's right. design school. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I agree. So, um, <clears throat> so you decided not to do theater. So what did you do? Well, because I was sort of stranded in Western Mass and back in 1980, it was a very quiet place. There wasn't a lot going on. I ended up working in retail. And that was great because that built up customer service, um, you know, gave me a structure. And um, eventually, that sort of got tiring, and I ended up working at UMass. And I landed in um, the Fine Arts Center in the box office. And I was um, an evening manager there for a couple of years full-time and then went part-time um, for many years. So I did end up working in theater. Hmm. Yeah. The front 
office. The front end of it, yeah, the yeah. front office. So that was good. So a lot of people know me that way too, but the, for the last... Well, I'm trying to get to how you're doing the things that we have here. So right. So you want to help me get okay, there? Okay, I'll get there. Okay. okay. Um, well, as we continue along, I've always, I've always been working on things. When, I, um, when my kids were younger and I wasn't working full-time, I would do substituting at the school and I would do um, early childhood ed classes. And um, so I would work a lot with the kids. And just on a whim, I ended up discovering paper making. And that was um, a project which I just fell in love with because by taking old school flyers that I can't ah, throw that's away. That's why these colors seem so familiar right, to me. Right, right. Over here? Yes. This is yep. like... It's all old school flyers. There's also some fine art center bulletins in here. There's, it's just, <laughs> I have more. If you want to know what the calendar was for um, 1999 at Deerfield Elementary, I still have it. <laughs> I see. Yeah, but so these are all papers that are made out of that, and I fell in love with that process, and it's the process of the art that I really love. I'm more of the creator starter. I'm not always finishing it, bring it to the so end. So can you say in, in a succinct sentence how you get from the flyer <coughs> in the wastebasket at the school to this piece of paper? Yes. So you, for me, what I do is I go strictly for the recycling aspect of it. I'll, um, you rip the papers up into about inch-sized pieces, and you put it in a blender with water and you blend it till it looks like runny oatmeal. And then you pour it into a big vat, and you swirl around the paper, and then you have something that has a, a, a frame, and you screen. dive into it in a screen with the frame, yep, and you dive into it, and it drains off all the liquid. And then your job is to transfer it from that frame onto a piece of material where you remove all the water through like a towel or sponges, and then you let it dry, and you end up with these lovely little pieces. Wonderful. But Wonderful. I was asked at one point to take it to the next level um, because I was renting a studio space from um, Pam, Ad Pam Adorno and Mimi Pirapan up in Shelburne Falls at a left and south gallery. And so they wanted me to go to the next level. And I was like, oh, OK. But I'm a really graphic person. I like things sort of simple and clean. And so I ended up um, in the center, you'll see the the bigger thing, but it's more like a paper quilt is what I call it. It's a quilt where the different types of papers are featured. Um, well, it's like I like a all the, Yeah, it's a sampler. I love all the paper. So I was doing things like this and the one with the lease behind me too. Yeah, simple and graphic, sort of realizing classically my style. And then a lot of times with my art, it's like, you know, I like to um, share my basic beliefs and for me the key thing that I would like to see all across the world is peace and I love doves so then I I went through a period where I'm making all these doves and um, they work for the holidays or any time and the thing I like about this one is you that the paper is I could I could pick my button I like this one because I got creative in that and that there's glitter and little um, things embedded in the paper so you're so. just plain ordinary glue to put the papers together. Yep, just plain ordinary glue. And what about the pin that you have up there on your right? Th this is actually, I dress for work today, so this is my daughter's work. So oh. this isn't mine, so. I we'll, 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 right. we'll get to her. You she'll, you'll be, I bet she'll be here someday. Yeah. Yes. So, so. so um, but then uh, my earlier, this is something I discovered when I was an adult. Before that, that's when I got into, I mentioned the pot holders earlier. So this is basically the pot holder um, frame. But then I did a weaving of it, and I would make little bags out of it. So this is, you know, those little green with the little? Yes. That's what this is. So this was woven on that little pot, pot holder frame. And then I folded it up, and I made a little bag out of it. So. Oh, you folded it in half. Yeah, right. so this is like a 30-year-old you know, piece. This is a 30-year-old. This you did through 30 years yes. ago. Yes, 1970s colors, 1980s. That's true. That's <laughs> absolutely it's true. It's let's, let's not move it around. Let's forget okay. it. Okay. Let's let's hold it up for a minute. Yes, indeed. That's, that's yeah. those those are the colors. What um, you told me earlier that you actually still have the yarn from this. Yes, I still do. Which from I'm thirty years ago. From thirty years. It's just in a little box because they were scrap ends, and I got some. Place. I would love to see your space. Is it is it really orderly with all your stuff? I'm not quite moved into it, so it's not it's not totally. What have you been doing up until now? I've been sort of spread out 
out all over nooks and crannies of my small house. So recently my son moved out of the house, and so I now have this little room to call my own. So I'm sort Isn't of... Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. It I really mean, is. I mean, both, that they yes. moved out of the house and that you have yes, a room yes. of your own. But my mother died in 1999, and so I got a lot of her yarn, I got a lot of her materials, and what my daughter hasn't used in her business, some of the materials I had, I've kept. And so, um, like recently, I knitted this little bottle of yarn um, that was left over from my mother because I love the reclaiming, recycling, reusing something that might have. This is just, um, po you know, polyfoam. Uh -huh. It's would identically be, a, you know, a toy. It's a, <laughs> it's a toy. toy. It's a wonderful but toy. But I, I really, I tend to go back to making little... And, and, and what the other... This thing? one here, um, I f fell in love with um, needle felting about, um, I don't know, six, six, seven years ago. And so I went into, um, and I'd get old products, and then I would do needle felting on them. Um, I do the same thing. Yes, yes. I've done some animals and different things like that, but I'm really getting into the point where... I want to have a, a reason why. It's like making something just to decorate isn't really appealing to me as much anymore as it, it needs to have a purpose, a place, it has to have a use. If it's not using old materials and making them to something else, I want it to be uh, functional. Sort of functional. Of functional yeah. art. So that's where I'm, I'm my, at when my it comes to My guess is that your house is filled with these kinds of things. Um, I've been on really a hiatus for a lot of stuff lately. Only recently have I sort of opened up. This has been shoved in boxes, or, which I just really re rediscovered, because that's the joy of, um, of being creative. You just, you just keep it on hand, and someday when you get the time, you can rediscover it, and you can just, you know, that spark will get relit. You said something to me earlier about having, particularly helpful to you was having a limited amount of things in front of you. Do you, do you remember that? Um, let's see. That, that, that it actually it, it some, does something to your creative juices having just a few things in front of you. Right, because then you, what do you, how do you put those things together? What do you As do opposed you to having everything. everything. Yep. Right. Yep. And that's where for many years a lot of my creativity ends up in cooking because you know you, You've got these five ingredients, and you need to make a dish out of it. So, whereas a lot of um, the textile work might have gone to the wayside, I would work on kitchen stuff. So, creating in the kitchen. So, mm -hmm. so I'm a, an everyday artist. I but like you're to think a, of a serious upcycler. Yeah, I really am. I realized that recently. Upcycling. Can you define upcycling for people who might not have heard that term? Yep. Yeah, upcycling, as I understand it, is pretty much taking things that had a life that would, instead of being thrown away, get, instead of recycled, into something you know, similar or different, like an old-fashioned glass bottle might have been melted down and be made into another bottle, or cans would be melted down into more cans. Upcycling is taking something that was used as something and making it into something that's actually better than what it was. Okay, what was this <coughs> before it became? This is a t-shirt. The, the orange is a T-shirt. Yep. Yes. Uh, the, I think of it as yellow. But yellow, the yellow is T-shirt. Yes. Yellow. And um, this is, uh, you know, a sunflower. And inside is uh, the wool felt that I had left over from the felting that I'm not doing as much anymore. And this is my piece de resistance. Yes. <laughs> this is from a costume I made in 1998 at the Deerfield the Elementary School. The green felt. So I'm reusing that. And what is behind that? Um, this is, I did buy the burlap, but, so it's burlap. And then needle felt, I mean, What's rug What's inside the burlap? Nothing. It's just what the backing. It? It's fat because the wool is on both sides. Oh, I see. And the material's on both sides. I took... Um, is it all glued together? In this case, it's glued. I chose to glue it um, because I could hide the fact that there's glue in it without showing any handwork. So you I, have two of them behind me here. Yes, and I have just started this process in the last two weeks, so this is... Is the sticks a part of it? Because the ones behind me have no sticks. Right, the idea is that um, people, you know, you could stick it in a vase and just let it sit there, but because I like functionality, I decided to add a pin on the back so it can be used as a oh, vase. Oh, so I can take this out? Yep. Uh-huh. And you can put it on your shirt. Right, because going around at a party with this stick might, Wouldn't be, work, yeah. might not work. Yeah. Or it might. And then it can go on bags or 
I on anything. Like that. Right. And I took that class at the Sheep and Shawl shop that's up on um, 5 and 10 yes. in the Tibetan Plaza. Um, Liz Sorensen opened it up a little more than a year ago. Yes. It's sort of just part of the whole like art and craft revival yes. that we have going on. She, in gives, the area. she gives classes Yeah, there. she does. Yeah. And I wanted to support her with one class, and I found this, and I was curious because the classic oh, rug hooking. Oh, you did hooking, this in her class? Um, I did yes. one similar to that. The classic um, rug hooking is, uh, you know, you have the yarn. Like the one in the back um, over there has the yarn coming out. And then another style is taking scraps of wool and making like a little a sort of Americana country type of pattern. But the person who taught it, and I'm sorry to say I forget her name. She was from Coleraine. She was using um, yarn in the center, and then she um, had some wool, and she also had some scrap material that she had dyed. And so we just cut that up, and we made um, the sunflowers out of it. And it, it just it realized, wait a minute, I can use felt from my felting. I can use yarn from my mother. I can use um, the the scrap because I don't have on here the things I would make out of t-shirts. So, so <clears throat> to be an artist like you are requires a storeroom, right? And to have a certain pack rat mentality. Uh, me yeah. Mentality. I have that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I I kept I keep things for a long time. Luckily, I have the space for that. And then suddenly you find the use for it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So tell us about this last item over on here on the table. Well, um, you had, uh, my son had put some art into a show that you had earlier, and that was the works on paper. And so I was like, okay, well, that's right. You know, Jane's having different shows here. So she had, you had something called Chair Dreams, and I came up with a very simple, flat design, which... I I liked it's but it's simple and it's graphic and it wasn't very dramatic it was cute and so I thought okay well you know I was inspired to go beyond that level to do more of a sculpture which is not something I do but going back to the doves um, that's where I was it was just the first process that I really had in quite a while where I just had some things in front of me and I wanted to make a statement and I just read the paper and it was one of those days where the paper was sort of depressing but also hopeful so I made sort of like a, you know a collage of different quotes on it and my favorite dove theme flying off the chair because when you're sitting in the newspaper you know you're sitting in the paper you're reading the chair these are all the things and so I get from it that I'd rather have you know the world and a little bit of peace on it so because without the newspaper I, I wouldn't have the world in front of me I love the newspaper I do too. Yeah. It's a lot of good recycling, uh, upcycling stuff. Yes, yes. Recycling also. Yes. Yeah, I have to say I don't really do as much with newspaper. I could. You could put newspaper in this paper to stretch it out or fluff it up. Uh -huh. But the ink um, I th isn't can the gray ink, it out. Isn't it, oh, the gray it out. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. So I tend to go uh -huh. more for the school. Right. Yeah, so I have, you know, <clears throat> fifth grade here, 1998. Here's probably 1997. <laughs> and now? Um, yeah, now they can make them into um, now, something new. What, what are you? What oh, what are am you, I doing now? now this I f I've landed on the. Um, on this. Yep. Yeah, this is. Okay. This is where <clears throat> I'm starting to play with. I, you know, starting with something small, and as I get to know the technique, because I think I've got that down well enough so that. Well, um, this is a big piece, don't you think? This call this a big piece. It is a big piece. It's a big paper sampler. Yep. I I would turn and look at it, but I was told not to. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I have it here. I see it yep. every day because it's here in the, in the yep. shop. Um, are you doing some of this work with the with the kids in the at the library? At the library, um, I we become busy enough so that there's not always a chance to um, set up different crafts. But I am setting aside on it's actually a new program called um, First and Third on the Saturdays because um, I work the first and third Saturdays. And so um, we've got some uh, material crayons so kids can bring in a t-shirt and they can color in the um, t-shirts and we'll set it. And then I've got different projects that we'll be adding onto it. Setting up the, um, the paper making often can be much more time consuming. That would do better in a different space than in a library where I'm the only one there. In and this I have space? To, yeah, it would do well here. It would do well. We'll talk. Okay, we will. <laughs> And then, um, yeah, we did needle felting at the library. We had a workshop there a couple of years back, 
And um, I walked in on that. It yeah. was fabulous. Yes. We, I we saw these people sitting around the table. They were making objects that were extraordinary. Yes. I sat in with them for a little That's bit. That's right. That, it was a long it, enough ago that I think I've forgotten that. But, yeah, it's a sweet little project. And then we taught knitting at the library, too, um, before we did the needle felting. And it's great because every now and then um, one of the women who took that class will come in and she'll she'll t tell me about this blanket that she made for her grandchild. And she's really gotten into knitting as she's retired. So that's been like one of those really rewarding things is that she's totally into it. And um, so it's nice to be able to show those skills to people at the library because, um, you know, it's a common space and there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. uh, libraries like I like newspapers. <laughs> That's right. Well, you're a very important center in town. Oh, thank you. And I think what you're demonstrating here, I'd like to think that we're demonstrating here, is that you can be creative with very simple things. And yes. you, it's not a matter of, of buying special paints or special canvases or right. expensive right. materials. Right. Here we are upcycling from stuff that people don't value anymore. And I only brought the things I like. Uh -huh. I do have some items that I don't like that I didn't bother bringing. And that's, Thank you. Yep. <laughs> and that's, but that's the key thing is that you, you realize that um, some of it's technique. Like this yellow flower, I happen to like the simple graphic of this. And I like the red one behind us for that same thing. I'm not in love with the yellow and black one or yellow and brown one up there. But I'm still learning that technique. And some people do like that. No, this is quite a, quite vivid. Yeah, it's Looks just a, good on the black. Right? I gave it to a friend at a meeting the other day, and um, I was amazed at all the people that came to the meeting. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's great. And I'm like thinking, hmm, mm, business, hmm, business, ah, business. If they like it, I can make it because I'm making it anyway. Because I'll make some art every day. That makes me think that perhaps one of the people I should interview here is somebody who could talk about the business of art. Yes, yes. And I do How have people like you can actually set up for business and yeah. make it. Right, because that's an important... Many of the artists, the question I ask is, are you supporting yourself mm -hmm. with your art? And if not, you know, how do you manage? Right. And in many cases, most artists, they always have to do something. something. Else. But I did hear of a success story of a person who was able to leave her... her um, 25 hour a week job and go straight into pottery recently so that's that's, good. that's really encouraging because pottery there is not the easiest a lot area. of potters there are so th it is encouraging and my daughter her business she's um, making every effort to to um, be self-supporting with her her art she makes uh, small pieces that are like the, the booties for children Right, she makes um, baby booties and toys, um, and she does craft fairs in the area. And I just was having a conversation to, with her last night, and I was really impressed because she had gotten um, a degree from fashion design from Mass Art, and she basically said, um, when I said, "Well, why aren't you making clothes?" She goes, "Mom, it's I don't like the sourcing of the materials. I don't like where it's coming from, and so she chooses solely to have an upcycled business. So her items are small because um, she gets." old wool sweaters and makes items from it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I wonder where she got that from. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, the whole family, your husband's a, a graphic artist. Yep, he's a graphic designer. He got a BFA in printmaking from Mass Art, I mean UMass. And then um, my son is pretty much a photographer, and he got a degree in music, general music, and a minor in photography. So. Well, we'll watch to see. Yes. Uh, Andy has been in two shows. Yes, right? and he's, he's, um, he had and something in the Tilton Library's um, auction, too, and that went well, too. So it's encouraging because uh -huh. um, it's, it's great to be able to see your kids follow their passion. Is, indeed it is. Yes. Uh, you know, as we're talking, <clears throat> there's a project, and here I have a, uh, an opportunity to talk to the public. There's something that I'm doing. It's upcycling of a sort, but it has to do with your stories. I'm an artist also, and I'm working on a project, on a piece. I don't know what the piece will look like yet, but I need stories about ironing. And I ask people for their ironing stories. Do you iron? I have ironed. You have ironed. I do actually have a little that story. That was a very important verb right. she used. She has ironed. And I, I've ironed a Could lot, but and I do iron. I'll tell you one quick story. You'll get a chuckle out of it. I was taught you do the collar first. Then you do the shoulder, 
and then you do the front, and then you work around at the back, and then you do the sleeves last. My I was taught that too. Right. My grandmother-in-law, her sister-in-law was um, a professional ironer, and she would lay it flat and iron it. And um, she would always like try to correct me. I'm like, but this is how my mother taught me. I can't. I can't what, iron it. What was the order she did? did she, she, she would lay it flat and then iron it flat and then so she not just, on an ironing board on, on an floor? ironing board but she wouldn't like try to get the cuff up here the shoulder and she wouldn't do the collar she so you end up having a crease up here which was different than I was used to so I was sort of resistant because I'm like my mother taught me how to iron. <laughs> so you don't iron anymore I do iron but um a lot of it is you know uh I'll wear more jersey or or I'll hang it to dry because I'll wear linen do you in like the summer ironing? I do like ironing I do um I haven't indulged in a new ironing board since 1981, and that's part of my problem when it comes to ironing because it's sort of leaning. So I uh -huh. should splurge and go get another ironing board, and I'd well, probably enjoy it more. Maybe you should come to speak to me because people have been dumping their ironing boards on me for a while. Really? Just the way I was collecting <laughs> chairs for oh, the yes. last show. Now I have a lot of ironing boards, and some of them are probably 100 years old. And they're the neat old ones that are wood. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, a good ironing board is a useful tool. A good, a good iron is a right. useful tool. Well, you know, you, but it's, you know, I want to tell the, the, whoever's listening here is that if you say to me, "No, iron," I don't even own an iron. That's a story too. Why do you not iron, or why do you not own an iron? How do you go about? I mean, obviously, it changes what you choose to buy in a store. If you choose never to iron, right, right. So, some people hate ironing, and some people love ironing. I mean, people actually have. Opinions. It's true about ironing, and I would like the stories because the stories are sometimes really quite wonderful. And that, to me, is the upcycling feature. I need a story to push me jump off of, to, yeah. to jump off of, and that's how I produce my art. Um, it takes less space in the house, yes, on the shelves, <laughs> <laughs> but it's sometimes harder to get because you have to reach out, as I'm doing today. Right. Well, I, actually, during my um, respite from some of the textile work, I wrote some children's books. So we wrote six. So we spent a couple of years. I should mention that um, writing some stories for children, and and I did find that but writing for special stories for special children. Right. 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 Basically. Um, Having been substituting in the school and being in part of the li in, in the library, I know that there's not a book for every kid out there, and so I wanted to write a book that appealed to a ten-year-old boy who was either reluctant or a little um, later in reading, either because of um, special needs. And so we wrote some stories, and my husband's illustrated. And we actually have six of those books, and the beauty about that is that it's good for early readers, it's good for, like adults, um, and it's written sort of in the in the area of Deerfield, so it's been sort of fun like that. Well, um, I, I want to thank you, Julie. Glad to be here. Julie Cavaco is our guest, and I want to thank you, and um, to the audience, this is Talking Art. Again, I remind you that I'm looking for um, any ideas you have of who I should be interviewing, and also questions you want me to ask, and uh, thank you, Julie, You're welcome. and thank you, everyone, for listening, and I'll see you next time.